Live from San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Oracle Open World 2015. Brought to you by Oracle. Now your host, John Furrier. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Francisco on Oracle Open World's Howard Street, where they shut the streets down in San Francisco for Oracle Open World, 60,000 people. This is the special CUBE presentation, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, exclusive coverage of Oracle Open World. Karen Sigmund, VP of Platform Business Group from Oracle, and Mike Rivet, Associate Partner, Global Head of Engineering Systems at CSC. Uh, great to have you on the CUBE. Welcome to the CUBE. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great to have you, Karen. Good to see you. you know, I know you're a big fan behind great the scenes. You, yes. Now on the big stage. Um, you, but you've been a real big supporter of theCUBE, appreciate that, thank you very much. Um, but you guys have some big news today, Exe Your Power program. Uh, I want to talk about that immediately because that's going to be a real competitive strike, certainly against IBM, right? So, so talk about the, the program. Well, what it really is, is we've been, as you probably know, uh, we've converted a lot of customers over the last couple of years from other systems to our Exadata platform. And as part of that, thousands of these migrations, we've had a lot of them where IBM Power. And what we decided to do is that uh, put together kind of a best practices. We had such great results. These customers had such great results with the exit program, or when we converted them, that we went ahead and created an actual program. And so what we're doing is now is we're offering a free uh, a, a proof of concept database migration for anybody that wants to move from their IBM Power 7 over to an Exadata platform. What's the role of Intel in this? I know Intel is involved. Can you share what's, yeah. what's Intel? Well, we work with them on, we've been good partners with Intel for years, and uh, we, we work on a lot of programs together, but this one in particular, we're just jointly funding these database migrations for our clients. And why would a customer move? Give it the reasons why. Why would they, why would they move over? Well, uh, you know, we've, uh, the ones that have, first off, they get great results, all right? We already have a number of examples of that. But we're also hearing a lot of customers voice some concerns, frankly, about what's happening with IBM and their divestiture of their hardware business. I mean, between the x86 server business to the chip business to, you know, just some of their own points in their own earnings reports about their strategic plan around hardware. And what specific customer examples can you share? Uh, one I would say would be uh, Pulte Group. Uh, it's one that Mark showed yesterday up on the stage and um, it was kind of a really cool uh, example because what they did is they their financial uh, their financial systems uh, improved over 15x by doing that. On top of that, they um, reduced their batch window by I'm not their batch window. They they reduced their monthly close by 33 percent. So they were able to actually increase the amount of t the shorten their um, time to close by 33 percent and they reduce their cost by 40%. So it's a really good result. Mike, your practice at CFC is to migrate folks over. Can you talk about that in some specific examples? Yeah, well, we've got a number of customers now that we've moved over onto engineer systems uh, and we migrate them across the globe. Um, I can't go into any specific customer details, but I'll give you anecdotal evidence. Um, I mean, we moved them across very rapidly. There's one going on in the US at the moment where it started in around September time. It's due to finish just after Christmas. We, we, we got stuck in the, um, in the Christmas coat, uh, freeze period. Otherwise, we'd have done it in about three months. So these are migrations that we're doing uh, repeatedly. That's fast. Yeah, absolutely, yes. And compared yeah. to the old, yes. we just had Deloitte on. They're like, oh my God, this is 24 months plus in the old days. Yeah. 10 years ago, five years ago. Now, you're talking about months, three months. We're talking months. Uh, we try and do all of the months inside 12 months. Uh, 12 months is a long migration for us. Most of them are uh, six months, six to nine months for big ones, three to six months for the smaller ones. But, but we're able to prove these migrations in, I mean, days, and sometimes even a week or two. So talk about the major performance and operational advantages, Mike, from the customers. I mean, what are, what are they seeing? We see significant advantages for our customers. You see much shorter uh, batch times, uh, much shorter backup windows and restore uh, windows when you need them, uh, need to do them. Uh, database cloning significantly improves, uh, and that leads to the whole improvement around DevOps uh, with great development and testing environments much, much faster uh, through the capabilities of the platform. And then you see um, secondary benefits. Um, the end users are now using a platform that is much more performance. And what we see is that People start to do things, especially in the analytic space, they'll start to do queries that they didn't previously consider was possible. In fact, they weren't possible, but the benefits that the system brings allows them to be more creative in the types of analysis that they do, and therefore more productive, and allow organizations to move into new markets and, and try new things. Karen, take me through the life of a POC, an example, because that, you know, that's a real world example. So take me through the mindset, how it gets going, 
Yeah. Uh, is it tire kicking? Is it more poking? Is it oh, is more serious? Let's get this going. Yeah. <laughs> Take us through a couple different use cases and examples. Uh, well, it depends on the customer, but let's just say a, a typical situation would be we'd uh, they'd call us and they'd say, hey, we're interested. Our sales rep would go out and say, does this make sense? They'd evaluate the workload and say, does it make sense to be on an engineered system? We'd do that analysis. Then we'd plan it out. What, what's the right timing for the customer to do it? We'd pick a database that would make sense for us to do a sample migration. And then we'd um, either do it on their premises, like we'd bring in an Exadata and do it there, or we'd do it in one of our solution centers. Uh, we have a number of solution centers where the customer can bring the data to and we'll do it and we'll do the data migration there. Or one of our partners like CSC would actually go out and do that migration for the customer in their location or on the customer's prem. So then we'd do that very shortly. And then at the end of that, we do a report for the customer that says, look, you've gotten, you've gotten these kind of results exactly out of this database. It's already migrated. And we give them a full plan that says this is what it's going to take for you to migrate the rest. So they walk away with a real roadmap. So who qualifies? I mean, is it uh, someone wakes up one morning and says, hey, you know, I'm going to do a migration? Or is there some motivation and someone gets a fire lit under their butt? Or is it more of a business mandate? And how does a customer know when it's a good time? Well, I think it's a couple things. One, they have to start, are they having issues? Are they looking to do an upgrade? Are they sitting on a Power 7 and trying to make a decision about what they're going to do next? Um, are they um, are they starting to have issues where they got to do a capacity increase on the in the environment they've got? I mean, what there could be any number of a compelling events that would drive a customer to make decide it's the time to change. So, I was at a Cube um, a coverage of IBM's event when they announced Power Eight and um, O Power and all these other things. It was also the same time they got out of the x86 business with Intel. Yeah. So I kind of find it ironic. This is kind of like coming together like that. So is that part of it? I mean, is it, or is this more of alternative to, to Oracle with Cisco? I mean, uh, Intel involved? I mean, how much is uh, Intel involved? No, I, uh, Intel's is it very... more you guys tap them No, in? Intel's very involved. I mean, if you uh, watch the Intel keynote here yeah. at Open World, you see a lot, of their, a lot of customers have a direct relationship with Intel, and they talk to their customers all the time. But no, this is really being driven more through the Oracle relationship with our customers. We're driving it. Intel is supporting us in the background, and we're out driving it together with the customers. What's the biggest thing you've learned with this program? What thing jumps out at you that you could that hit that hits you right hard and says, "Okay, wow, this is working." Give us some examples. Um, well, one, I guess how quickly the results are. The fact that we're we we have a backlog of customers already, and we haven't even launched the official program. <laughs> and we literally That's a good problem yeah, to have. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> How about the deployment side? You guys are partnering as well. I mean, you have customers. You guys are partnering with your customers. Engineered systems are pretty in demand. I mean, could you share some insight into you know, to level of customer involvement with engineered systems, specifically this program? And just in general, this notion of engineered systems is really hot right now. Engineer systems is a uh, is a concept that's, that's certainly uh, gathered momentum. Uh, and to be honest, I'll talk more about the vertical integrated system because that's a concept that everyone's really familiar with. It's it's something that everyone's talking about. It's the the move from the the build it yourself to the pre built. Uh, and the, there's some really good reasons for doing that. It's uh, organisations want to focus on the uh, on the business that they do. They don't want to be SI shops. They don't want to spend all their time patching a, and maintaining systems. So an engineer system gives you all those benefits. But the Oracle one adds the engineering changes as well. So you get all the uh, uh, the engineering enhancements as well. And that allows us to be much denser in our consolidation. So when we move databases onto an engineer system, uh, the core count reduces significantly, the floor space count, uh, so the environmental savings are enormous. And so there's any number of reasons why organizations are really keen to move onto these platforms. You know, it's interesting, we've been doing the Cube, it's our sixth Oracle Open World. We, as you know, Karen, we do a lot of different events. You know, four or five years ago when Dave and I were talking about purpose-built boxes, People were poo-pooing this whole engineered systems thing. You remember those days? It's like, oh, yeah. oh are you kidding me? No one's <laughs> going to buy a box from Oracle. It's going to be vertically integrated. So, but but if you look at that, I mean, they were wrong on that. We would say, hey, you know what? And our argument on the cube was, you know, as Paul Moritz would say at uh, was he was at VMworld at VMware at the time was, the world's shifting, and then where's the hardened top? No one really cares if it as it works and there's choice. So versus the lock-in, which is everyone was like, oh, lock-in. No one wants to. But turns out customers actually want a engineered system because they just want power functionality, but yet they want the openness. You guys see that dynamic? Yeah, I, would, I was going to say, um, I, I was just going to say, I think the uh, one thing we see repeatedly is that so many customers have done do-it-yourself, build your own projects, and they've taken longer than they expected, they're out of budget, they don't meet the business requirements, they don't meet the SLAs. You know, with the engineered systems, it's really, it's a, it's a product, it's not a project. Yeah. 
It's, that's the difference. You can plug it in right away and get value yeah, out of that's it. That's right. Yeah. Well, and also the pressure from the customer, I'd like to get your thoughts yeah. on this, is, is that they're also building out in other areas. Mm. So they don't really want to waste time, right. you know, doing stuff that's already been done. Yeah, and, and so the market yeah, seems guess, to be the issue. Well, the marketplace is changing so much over the last few years. And in fact, in the last 12 months, we're seeing fantastic acceleration in things getting to market. Organizations can no longer, no longer have the luxury to spend months building their own environments. They need to put something on the ground, turn it on, and have it available tomorrow. And, and it's the engineered systems that are allowing them to do that. We were talking with Emmett earlier, Lavery, who's the senior vice president of the cloud, and um, love having the product guys on because it's fun. We get to <laughs> dive deep into the weeds. And Brian Gracely of Wikibon.com was saying, hey, you know, there's always conflict between agility and security. And that's always been uh, been at, uh, at odds with each other because, hey, let's go fast, let's break stuff. Well, you don't break stuff, it's yes, you know, security. Yeah. But now with the engineered system, some of the things around this end-to-end -end stuff, it brings a whole other dimension. Oh, yeah. So can you comment on what you've learned and in, in with this program and some of the customers you talked to around offering agility at the oh. same time not breaking things? Well, I think that's, um, I think a couple things. One is when you look at our Exadata platform, if a customer does take advantage of this program and migrate off of Power7 over to an Exadata platform as an example, they have the option now to run that in the cloud. They have the option to run it on-prem. They can use one, one uh, single pane of glass to manage both environments. So it's not just um, it's not just migrating it from one platform to another. It's migrating it from a platform to something that's going to have life across both the cloud and on-premises. How about CSE? What do you guys see in this cloud? Because obviously you guys have, have evolving this tran digital transformation is happening. Yeah, yeah. Just thoughts anecdotally on what the customer's mindset is right now. What is the current state of the customer? The current state of the customer. And I, so I've been presenting at a few uh, few events around here this week, and and we're seeing a significant shift. And with customers wanting to move towards digital or, or to, to cloud, in fact. Uh, and what you find is, uh, and as, uh, as um, was said earlier on today in the keynote, was not everything's going to go to cloud. Something's going to stay on-prem. So the challenge is, how do we spend Although the Although Mark two? Hertz said 100% of test and devs going to be That was test and dev, yeah. 20, 20, 20, yeah, 20, still 20, 20, long 25, ways away. Yeah, and 20% was going to stay on-prem for production as well. <laughs> so you've always got to do, the, uh, do that uh, stitching the two environments together. Yeah, I would agree. Now, now one of the things that, that's really <laughs> important here, and it's something that uh, we've been working very closely with Oracle on, is, is how to bridge this hybrid. Because when you move to cloud, developing on a platform that's the same as what you're doing on-prem is really, really important. And some of the initiatives that have been announced this week are around the engineer systems available as platforms and service in the cloud. So this single plane of glass that it moves us to, allows us to move workloads seamlessly between public and private cloud is really important. And the to hybrid, that's where the hybrid actually That's what the hybrid is. Yesterday yeah, we coined the term engineered clouds. If Oracle, you want to use that, feel free to <laughs> you know, contact my yeah. copyright attorney. We'll get this licensing <laughs> yeah. fee in place. Or, but no, that's what hybrid is. Yeah. Hybrid is not a product. Can I no, use that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to my lawyer. No, yeah. seriously, engineered systems really takes us into the engineered cloud, right? Yeah, because right. hybrid yeah. isn't, and there's no skew. No. Give me, there's, no, there's no hybrid product. It's an outcome of on-prem or private. Yeah. To public, absolutely, and that in between. That's what Larry's yeah. officially putting out there. Yeah. You would agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And not only that, we're seeing customers doing it. There's a major customer in the UK we're just doing some work with, uh, and it started as a wholly and solely private cloud uh, conversation. And this is Christmas time, and it's already moved into a how can we accelerate the adoption of SaaS? And the way we're doing it is by being able to stitch the the public and the private cloud together and using a common platform and a common framework. Right. So we're seeing a massive acceleration. And what's of this the motivation? Move to Sean Price is on earlier. Great. Great interview, new guy here on the block here at Oracle. Talk about the pressure is really coming from the OpEx, CapEx equation. Is that a primary motivation, the primary or one of them? It's primary motivation, It's uh, and, and it, was in, uh, it was in the keynote later on today. Uh, budgets are dropping dramatically. And everyone's got to do more. And so it's a move from uh, op uh, CapEx to OpEx. Do more with less. That's been the do theme of IT less. for like two decades. But <laughs> cloud lets you do it. Uh, and uh, while I was talking about on the presentation around today that I was doing, that it's uh, utility computing. It's about metered servicing. So you pay for the uh, database consumption at the point of use. You don't buy the asset up front and then, then run it down. You just pay for the service as and when you need it. Karen, you're an industry vet. We, we always have these conversations. I mean, what do you think about this whole engineered purpose-built box solution now that's been validated? In the era of open source, you have the combination of open source, which is horizontally scalable. That's commodity hardware. Yet, vertically integrated solutions, they're not mutually exclusive in a cloud world and yeah, on-prem world. You know, I mean, open, we, first off, we support open stack and we open a number of open standards, industry standards on all of our solutions. There's no question about that. I mean, look at what we've just announced with our, we have a Linux uh, new open stack uh, um, uh, um, that we've just launched and we have Solaris on the M7 we just launched with a tr tremendous amount of open yeah. capability. 
But the, if you look at where the industry has moved from and where it's going to, we've had this issue where they've had um, the, the, the you, we've gone from these purpose-built solutions to best-of-breed technologies. Now we're going back to purpose-built. The difference is in this iteration is the purpose-built has to work with the cloud and on-prem. That's number and one. And open standards. And open standards. And it has to be able to, you have to be able to unplug. So okay. one of the values of the way we've built our engineered systems is, is that while you get benefit from the full stack and the integration of everything in between, you can still go run it on something else if you choose. It's not like we're not locking you in. It's a huge advantage It's also for giving customers. some more horsepower to the whole analytics business, That's which right. is really booming. And this yes. actually rises the tide, if you will, for analytics. Yeah, yeah. as an example, our big data appliance um, runs in on-prem or in the cloud, exactly the same solution, same, same opportunity. It's interesting, Dave Vellante and I were commenting uh, at a Hadoop Summit last year and then recently at Strata Hadoop at Hadoop World that you're finally seeing the cloud come into maturity from a client perspective, which has kind of like helped lift up the analytics market. It's been kind of a lull for about two years in the Hadoop ecosystem, certainly, and in analytics as the data warehouse market's shifting because Analytics needs power, mm. right? And now with security and more, more cores and more everything else with M7 and whatnot and super clusters, you got, got all that. So I got to ask you, Mike, because you know, you're, you're in, the, in the trenches, you're in, with the front lines, you're also uh, you know, a geek like all of us. <laughs> We're all like you know, geek buffs. We like to look under the hood uh, of the cars, if you will, the engines of the, of, the, of the systems. What is getting you excited right now? On, if you open the hood, you know, the stuff that gets abstracted away from the customer. What's that's exciting you? That's a really good question. The, um, the rate of advancement is astonishing. There are things we can do today that we can only dream about yesterday. The, uh, the chip design advances, you know, the, the stuff they're putting down onto the silicon, the, the fact that uh, the network advances. I mean, I was watching the Intel one about the memory advances. I mean, that's just a fascinating advance uh, to be able to do that level of density. That's going to transform the industry again. And what is it, only 18 months away before that becomes, uh, becomes actually available? I and mean, if you so, think about it, back in the old days when we were growing up, when you were writing, when I was writing code, soft, you the right software to account for the lack of memory and you use disk, which is abundant. Yeah. Now it's the other way around. You have more memory and less disk, or, or you have more yeah, memory. Yeah, yeah. So you gotta, it's, it's a software paradigm shift it is. on uh, how to write code, right? I, I used to do bit stacking <laughs> because you couldn't afford the use of an int to do a flag, so you used to bit offset to do your flags. Uh, so yes, I'm showing my age a bit there. We all know um, 64K, <laughs> man, that was like making it all work. And you know, but Memory is just so abundant now, uh, and you're just doing everything in memory. So, you know, disk is, disk is so old hat. My, f my friend worked on the original Apple stuff. He's like, yeah, we would fight over bytes and Ks, yeah. you know, just in the OS. But you know, now we're talking about a lot of in memory. What does that mean? Share your, some color, because a lot of you who aren't in, in the know, inside the ropes, if you will, what is that going to open up from, it, from an innovation standpoint, all the in-memory innovations, yeah. combined with the software on silicon? So what we're really seeing, and what customers are getting really excited about, is we're calling it data enrichment. You might think of it as a big data 2.0, if you like. Um, but what we now have the ability to do is to, to move massive amounts of data into a single uh, data source in memory and do data joins that were previously impossible to do. We, we can do analytics on data in memory that were previously just, because of network bandwidths and various other uh, limitations, were impossible, took days or weeks. We can do in seconds what we used to do in weeks. And it's we just, had a pre-throwback Thursday conversation with John Fowler about mainframes, and the thing that we were talking about is now, it's not just single-threaded apps, it's multi-thread over right. hundreds yeah, yeah. of cores. Yeah. In and memory, I mean, it's pretty mind-blowing. It's yeah, absolutely mind-blowing, yeah. Yeah, and if you look at what we're doing with Exadata, for instance, and the, the thing that's really unique about it is the fact that we've got the database engineers also designing the hardware. Yeah. So when you think about the in-memory conversation you're talking about, it's the whole idea that we can take our Exadata platform based on Intel and actually integrate those two things together and, bu and build a platform for the clients. As we end the segment, Karen, I want you to share some of your personal insight around how powerful and how um, solid the, the momentum and traction is with Exadata. I mean, it that's doesn't true. get a lot of fanfare, I mean, it does in the geek circles, but like, you know, give us some anecdotal data around like just how successful it's been. It's been kind of ridiculous. We have thousands of customers, all of the top financial institutions, all of, you name the industry and they're running Exadata. Anybody, I mean, more than 
um, more, I, I forget the, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I say it was, I think it's 70% of a lot of, of all the major platforms out there run Oracle database. A lot of those customers are migrating over to an Exadata yeah. because they get the benefit of running that well, database. They're also re-architecting around Exadata. It's like a sports team. You build around your, your best player, right? I yeah. mean, you build your offense around kind of your best performer. That's right. And I've heard some medieval things that they were doing. <laughs> Exadata, some of these banks in New York, I'm like, what, fiber channel? Can I, oh, wait, wait a minute, yeah. wait, wait a minute, I mean, wait a minute. You, you look at some yeah, of don't the tell anyone. I'm like, <laughs> okay. You look at the, some of the numbers. I mean, Exadata by itself brings huge benefits to our customers, but when you combine Exadata with the other purpose-built systems, we are, we, uh, customers see huge Huge benefits. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and sharing that awesome insight. Uh, did you know we have podcasting now on theCUBE? Go to siliconangle.tv and check out our podcast. We have Women Wednesday featured, and also our guest of the week, decided by the crowd and our editors, gets a featured podcast. And of course, go check out all of our videos at crowdpages.co slash OOW15. All the content from this event here in theCUBE and what's happening in the conversation is at that site. It's our new social cloud. Check it out. We'll be right back more here on Howard Street for more CUBE coverage after this short break. <laughs>